Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Armen, Professor Armen uh, from Yerevan, Armenia. Professor Armen Astvat Sadrian, Yerevan, Armenia. And so you are on Dr. Y channel. And today we continue to talk about healthcare research and statistics. Health statistics and research, up to you. Today's second topic, second lesson, second lecture. And as I promised, we will talk about evidence based medicine. So, basis of evidence based medicine. What is evidence based medicine? So, evidence based medicine is the conscientious, explicit, and judicious, judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. The aim of evidence-based medicine is to integrate the experience of the clinician, the values of the patient, and the best available scientific information to guide decision-making about clinical management. Okay? Conscientious. 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 So evidence-based medicine is conscientious, conscientious, explicit, <laughs> and judicious use, judicious, judicious, judicious use. So judicious use of current best evidence is making decisions about the care of individual patients. So our aim to integrate the experience of the clinician the values of the patient and the best available scientific information to guide decision making about clinical management. The term was originally, originally used to describe an approach to teaching the practice of medicine and improving decisions by individual physicians about individual patients, specific physician about specific patients. So medicine has a long medicine has a long history of scientific inquiry about the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of human disease. The concept of control, controlled clinical trial was first described by Jan, Jan Baptist van Helmont in the reference of the practice of bloodletting. What is road? Road van Helmont. And a quote, let us take out of hospitals, out of the camps, or from elsewhere, 200 or 500 poor people that have fevers or pleuritis. Let, this, let us divide them in halves. Let us cast lots that one half of them may full of my share and others of the yours. So let us cast lots, random. Huh? I will cure them without blood letting and sensible evacuation but you do as you know we shall see how many funerals both of us shall of us shall have so logic logic quite enough uh, yes quite enough fair enough the first published report describing the conduct and results of a controlled clinical trial was by james lind a Scottish naval surgeon who conducted research on scurvy during his time about HMS Salisbury in the Channel Fleet. HMS Salisbury was a 50-gun force raid ship of the line of the Royal Navy, HMS Salisbury. She was built during the war of the Australian succession and went on to sea action in Seven Years' War, serving in the East Indies. In the Channel Fleet, while patrolling the Bay of Biscay, so HMS Salisbury is in the Channel Fleet when patrolling the Bay of Biscay. So Bay of Biscay or Biscay. Actually, I don't know. Bay of Biscay or Bay of Biscay? Bay of Biscay. Bay of Biscay. You know where is it? Huh? So, France Ocean, huh? France Ocean, France shore of the Atlantic Ocean, on the west of the 
France. So Lind divided the sailors participating in this experiment into six groups so that the effects of various treatments could be fairly compared. Lind found improvement in symptoms and signs of scurvy. Huh? Scurvy. Scurvy. Among the group of men, of men, sorry, treated with lemons or oranges. No, vitamin C. Huh? Ascarbin acid. So he published a treatise. He published a treatise. Treatise? Huh? Scientific trial. Treatise. Treatise. Describing the results of this experiment in 1753. A nearly critic of statistical methods in medicine was published in 1835. The term, so yes, statistical research, yes. So the term evidence-based medicine was introduced in 1990 by Gordon Guyatt of McMaster University. Alvin Feinstein's publication in Clinical Judgment in 1967 focused attention on the role of clinical reasoning in identifying biases that can affect it. Biases is an error. Huh? In 1972, Archie Coch Cochrane published Effectiveness and Efficiency, which, so Archie Cochrane, and let's understand huh? how it pronounce. Archie Cochrane. Archie Cochrane published Effectiveness and Efficiency, which described the lack of control, the trials supporting many practices that had previously been assumed to be effective. What? Really? In, if you try to test them? In 1973, John Wenberg began to document wide, wide variations in how physicians practiced. Through 1980s, David, David Eddy described errors in clinical reasoning in gaps in evidence. In the mid-1980s, Alvin Feinstein, David Sackett, and others published textbooks on clinical epidemiology, which translated epidemiological methods to physician decision-making. To physician decision-making. Toward the end of the 1980s, a group of RAND showed that large proportions of procedures performed by physicians were considered inappropriate, inappropriate even, by, uh, even by standards of their own experts. So what is RAND? RAND Corporation, my friend, is an American non-profit global policy think tank created in 1948 by Douglas Aircraft Company to offer research and analysis to the United States Armed Forces. Uh, David Eddy first began to use the term evidence-based in 1987 in workshops and manual commissioned by the Council of Medical Specialty Societies to teach formal methods for design, designing clinical practice guidelines. The manual was eventually published by, America, by the American College of Physicians. Eddie first published the term evidence based in March 1980s, in March 1980, in an article of the Journal of American Medical Association that laid out the principles of evidence based guidelines and population level policies, which Eddie described as explicitly, explicitly, yeah, explicitly. Describing, no, obviously, uh, explicitly describing the available evidence that pertains to a policy and typing the policy to, to evidence instead of standard of care practices on the beliefs of the of experts. The pertinent pertinent evidence must be identified, described, and analyzed. The policy makers must determine whether the policy is justified by the evidence. A rationale must be written. A rationale must be written. He discussed evidence-based 
policies in several other papers published in JAMA in the spring of 1990. Those papers were part of a series of 28 published in JAMA between 1990 and 1997 on formal methods for designing population level guidelines and policies. So the term evidence-based medicine was introduced slightly later in the context of medical education. In the medical education, in the autumn of 1980, Gordon Guyatt used it in an it in unpublished description of a program of a program at McMaster University for pers prospective of a new medical students like you, my friends. Guyatt and others first published the term two years later, 1992, to describe a new approach to teaching the practice of medicine. In 1996, David Sackett and colleagues clarified the definition of this tributary of evidence-based medicine as the conscientious, as I said, explicit and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. It means integrating individual clinical expertise with the best available external clinical evidence from the systemic research. This branch of evidence-based medicine aims to make individual decision-making more structured and objective by better reflecting the evidence from research. Population-based data are applied to the care of an individual patient while respecting the fact that the practitioners have clinical expertise reflected in effective and efficient diagnosis and thoughtful identification and, and compassionate use of, of individual patients' pre predicaments, rights and preferences. Between 1993 and 2000, the Evidence-Based Medicine Working Group at McMaster University published the methods to a broad physician audience in a series of 25 users' guides to the medical lecture in lecture, uh, literature, medical literature, sorry, in JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association. In 1995, Rosenberg and Donald, Donald, defined, not Trump, uh, defined individual level evidence-based medicine as the process of finding, appraising, appraising. Appraising. Yeah. And using contemporaneous research findings at the basis of medical decisions. In 2010, 2010, Greenhalk used a definition that emphasized quantitative methods. The use of mathematical estimates of the risk of benefit and harm derived from the high-quality research on population samples to inform clinical decision-making in the diagnosis, investigation, or management of, of individual patients. The two original definitions highlight important differences in how evidence-based medicine is applied to populations versus individuals. When designing guidelines apply to a large groups of people in settings with relatively little opportunity for modification by individual physicians, evidence-based policymaking emphasizes that good evidence should exist to document a test of treatment effectiveness. In the setting of individual decision-making, practitioners can be given greater latitude in th how they interpret research and combine it with their clinical judgment. In 2005, Eddie offered an umbrella definition for the two branches of evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based medicine is a set of principles and methods intended to ensure that to the greatest extent pos possible medical decisions, guidelines and other types of policies are based on the consistent with good evidence of effectiveness and benefit. In the area of evidence-based guidelines and policies, the explicit insistence of, on evidence of, effective, of effectiveness was introduced by American Cancer Society in 1980. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force began issuing guidelines for preventive interventions based on evidence-based principles in 1984.
issuing. Okay, so the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force began issuing guidelines for preventive interventions based on evidence-based principles in 1984. In 1985, the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association applied strict evidence-based criteria for the covering new technologies. It was criteria in 1985, <coughs> Blue Cross Blue Shield. This is association. Beginning in 1987, specialty societies such as the American College of Physicians and voluntary health organizations such as the American Heart Association AHA, wrote many evidence-based guidelines. In 1991, Kaiser Permanente Kaiser Permanente Kaiser Permanente a managed care organization in the United in the United States began an evidence-based guidelines program. In 1991, Richard Smith wrote an additional editorial. Sorry, 1991. Yeah, Richard Smith wrote an editorial in the British Medical Journal and introduced the ideas of evidence-based policies in the United Kingdom. In 1993, the Cochrane Collaboration created a network of 13 countries to produce systematic reviews and guidelines. In 1997, United States Agency of, for Healthcare Research and Quality, AHRQ, A -H -R -Q. so U.S. Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, then known as the Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research, then known H A A H C P R A H C P R established evidence based practice centers, famous EPCs, evidence based practice centers to produce evidence reports and technology assessment to support the development of guidelines. In the same nineteen ninety seven year, same year, National Guideline Clearinghouse that followed the principles of evidence based policies was created by uh, U.S. Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, DMA, American Medical Association, and the American Association of Health Plans, now America's Health Insurance Plans. In 1999, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, NICE, was created in the United Kingdom. Ah, my face immortal. In the area of medical education, medical schools in Canada, the US, United Kingdom, Australia, and other countries now offer programs that teach evidence-based medicine. A 2009 study of United Kingdom programs found that more than half of United Kingdom medical schools offered some of United Kingdom programs found that more than half of United Kingdom medical schools offered some training in evidence-based medicine, although the methods and content varied considerably, the evidence evid uh, and evidence-based medicine teaching was restricted by lack of curriculum time, trained tutors, and teaching materials. Many programs have been developed to help individual physicians gain better access to evidence. For example, up-to-date was created in the early 1990s. The Cochrane collaboration began publishing evidence reviews in 1993. In 1995, British Medical Journal publish, uh, Publishing Group launched Clinical Evidence, a six-monthly periodical that provide periodical that provided brief summaries of the current state of evidence about important clinical questions for clinicians. By 2000, currently now current practice, use, the term, use of the term evidence-based has extended to other levels of healthcare system. An example is evidence-based health services, which seek to increase the competence of health service decision makers and the practice of evidence-based medicine at the organization, organizational or institutional level. 
The multiple tributaries of evidence-based medicine share an emphasis on the importance of incorporating evidence from formal research in medical policies and decisions. However, beca because they differ on the extent to which they require good evidence and effectiveness before promoting a guideline or payment policy, a distinction is sometimes made between evidence-based medicine and science-based medicine, which also takes into account factors such as prior plausibility, 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 and compatibility with established science. For example, as when medical organizations promote controversial treatments such as acupuncture. 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 Differences also exist regarding the extent to which it is feasible to incorporate individual level information in decisions. Thus, evidence-based guidelines and policies may not readily hybridize, hybridize or hybridize. Hybridize. Hybridize with experience-based practices orientated, orienta orientated towards ethical clinical judgment and can lead to contradictions, contest, and un unintent crisis, crisis. The most effective knowledge leaders, the managers and clinical leaders, use a broad range of management knowledge in their decision-making rather than just formal evidence. Evidence-based guidelines may provide the basis for governmentally, gov governmentality in healthcare and consequently play a central role in the governance of contemporary healthcare system. The steps for designing explicit evidence-based guidelines were described in the late 1980s, formulate the question Population, intervention, comparison, intervention, comparison, intervention, outcomes, time horizon setting. S uh, search the literature to identify studies that inform the question. Interpret each study to determine precisely what it says about the question. If several studies addresses the question, synthesize, synthesize their results, so-called meta-analysis. So what is meta-analysis? Maybe... I will talk about that in another lecture. Actually, I don't know. It depends on my time. Summarize the evidence in evidence tables. Compare the benefits, harms, and costs in a balance sheet. Draw a conclusion about the preference, preferred practice. Write a guideline. Write a rationale for the guideline. Have other reviews. Have, have other review each of the previous steps. Implement the guideline. For the purpose of medical education and individual level decision making, the five steps of evidence-based medicine in practice were described in 1992, and experience of delegates attending in the 2003 conference of evidence-based healthcare teachers and developers was summarized into five steps and published in 2005. This five-step process can broadly be categorized as follows. First, Translation of uncertainty, uncertainty, uncert uncertainty, uncertainty, uncertainty to an answerable, qu answerable question. The translation of uncertainty to an uns answerable question includes critical questioning, study designs, and levels of evidence, systematic retrieval of the best evidence available critical appraisal of evidence of for internal validity that can be broken down into aspect regard into aspects regarding systematic errors as a result of selection bias information bias and confounding quantitative aspect of diagnosis and treatment defect size and aspects regarding its precision clinical importance of results external validity or generalizability, application of results in practice, evaluation of 
performance. Systematic reviews of published research studies are a major part of evaluation of particular treatments. The Cochrane Collaboration is one of the best known organizations that conducts systematic reviews. Like other products of systematic reviews, it requires authors to provide a detailed study protocol as well as a reproducible plan of their literature research and evaluation of the evidence. After the best evidence is assessed, treatment is categorized as likely to be beneficial, likely to be harmful, and three, without evidence to support either benefit or harm. A 2007 analysis of 1,016 systematic reviews from all 50 Cochrane collaboration review groups found that 44% of the reviews concluded that inter interventional was likely to be beneficial, 7% concluded that the intervention was likely to be harmful, and 49% percent concluded, concluded, concluded that evidence didn't support either benefit of or harm or benefit or harm either benefit or harm 96 percent recommended further research in 2017 to 10, 10 years after a study assessed to the role of systematic reviews produced by Cochrane collaboration to inform United States private payers policy making it showed that Although the medical policy documents of major United States private payers were informed by Cochrane systematic reviews, there was still scope to encourage the further use. So, uh, evidence-based medicine, uh, evidence-based medicine categorized different types of clinical evidence and rates of grades or grade them according to the strengths of their freedom from the various biases that beset medical research. That beset medical research. For example, the strongest evidence uh, for therapeutic interventions is provided by systematic review of so-called randomized, well-blind, placebo-controlled trials with allocation consolement and complete follow-up involving of homogeneous patient population and medical condition. So what is randomized, well-blind, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials, etc., etc. Actually, really, I don't know about my time. You've got one, so I will explain you in some other lectures. So, okay. Uh, if God wants, no problem. In contrast, patients' testimonials, case reports, and even expert opinion have little values as proof because the placebo effect, the biases inherent in observation and reporting of cases and difficulties in ascertaining who is an expert. However, some critics have argued that expert opinion doesn't belong in the rankings of the quality of empirical evidence because it doesn't represent a form of empirical evidence and continue that expert opinion would seem to be a separate, complex type of knowledge that would not fit into hierarchies, hierarchies otherwise limited to empirical evidence alone. Several organizations has, have developed grading system for assessing the quality of evidence. For example, in 1985, uh, 1989, the United States Preventive Services Tech Force put forth uh, the following system that we use now. So, level one, evidence obtained from at least one properly designed randomized controlled trial. It's the best one. Huh? Level two, one, evidence obtained on Roman numbers. Huh? Level one, two, three. So, level two, Roman number one, evidence obtained from well-designed controlled trials without randomization. So, the best is randomization without level 2.1. Level 2.2, evidence obtained from well-designed cohort studies or case control studies, preferably for more than one center or research group. Actually, level one is multicentric. Huh? Groups. So, level 2.3, evidence obtained from multiple time series designs with or without intervention. Dramatic results in uncontrolled trials might also be regarded as a type of evidence. Now, in level 3, opinions 
of respected authorities based on clinical experience, descriptive studies or reports of experts' committees. And from this point we will continue in the next lecture. Thanks for your attention, my friends. Don't forget to follow and subscribe our channel. And don't forget about your donates. <laughs> How to make your donations you can find in the description of this video in YouTube or in podcast. So goodbye and God bless you. Bye-bye.